standing and take your hymnals and turn with me, if you will, to hymn number 245, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, 245. sing those particular hymns as we approach the Advent season, as we hear the voice of Israel in the Old Testament crying out for the promised Messiah, and we ourselves looking forward with eagerness and expectancy to his imminent return at any time. Our text for today is in Exodus chapter 3, and we have been studying this for one week, not two weeks. Uh, I apologize for the typo in the bulletin. This is part two of uh, the study in the names of God. Last week, of course, was Thanksgiving Sunday, and so we dealt with praise and thanksgiving. The previous week, we began the study on the names of God, and so we have just finished one part 
of what I think will be a four-part series on the names of God. Now you recall that two weeks ago we saw, as we were looking at our text, the name of God, which is actually a compilation of eight different names which are given to us in that portion of scripture that we read a little earlier this morning. Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. And we found that the eight names of God that are listed there are, I am that I am, I am, Lord with all capital letters, L-O-R-D, God with a large G and a little O-D, and those represent different names of God in the text. Then we saw a phrase which describes God, the Lord God of your fathers, and then we found three specific titles that God uses for himself, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And as we look at this, nonetheless, God says that this is a singular name, because he says, this is my name, singular, forever. Notice also that God says that his name is a memorial unto all generations, and we studied that in some depth because we studied that on Memorial Day. But God has not given us his name just for being able to generally know, oh, there's a God out there and he does have a name, like some of the pagan gods have names, but it is a memorial. God has not given us just days of the year to remember him by, though there are special occasions throughout the year. But what he has given us as a memorial unto all generations is his name. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. We can remember, of course, his acts at special times, and we do that as we remember the incarnation in just a few weeks, where God became a man and dwelt among us. But we must never forget him as to who he is, what his character is. For the name of God and all of these different facets of it that we will see, each reflects a different character quality concerning who he is personally. We saw that that first name of God, which he gave to himself, I am that I am, is actually a declaration and explanation of God's covenant relationship with Abraham and with his chosen people. It's interesting because we discover that that phrase, I am that I am, is from a verbal form that is the root of the name Yahweh, or Jehovah, or Lord in all capital letters as we have it in our text. That's the covenant name that God uses for himself every time he reaffirms the Abrahamic covenant. Genesis 12.1, Genesis 13, Genesis 15, Genesis 17, Genesis 21, and Genesis 22. When he speaks to Abraham, that is the way in which he identifies himself. In other words, the name Jehovah or Yahweh is a different form of the same word that is translated in that phrase, I am that I am. It's a very important name of God in the Old Testament. In the book of Genesis alone, it occurs 211 times in 185 verses. That is the covenant name of God given in the book of Genesis. That's the name that expresses him as the self-existing God, the self sustaining God, the self-eternal God. I am that I am. This is the God that makes his own choices based upon his own character and upon his own determination, not upon external pressure. This is the name of the sovereign God who has no external needs and no external obligations. This is the way in which God reveals himself by his name as the one who always has been, who is now, and who always will be. And this, of course, is what we saw of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who was and is 
and who shall be. Our Lord Jesus Christ, through this name and through the quotations that we saw in the New Testament, declares himself to be the Jehovah, the covenant God of Israel in the Old Testament. And they hated him for that declaration and took up stones to stone him. Sometimes that name we saw is abbreviated as Yah. Instead of Yahweh, it's Yah. We find that 49 times in the Old Testament. And each time we find it, it's in the context of a personal God who has a special relationship with his people in redemption. Not merely he is their covenant God, but it is used in each of these 49 contexts in relation to his redemption of his people. He is the one who has become our salvation. Exodus 15, 2, the Lord, Yah, is my strength and song. He is become my salvation. Exodus 15, 2. He is the God who is the just God who goes to war for his people because the end of those verses says, the Lord is a man of war, the Lord is his name, and we find our Lord Jesus Christ as the one coming from heaven in Revelation chapter 19 and going to war to judge sin and wickedness in this world. And it is there that we have that phrase that is so beautifully portrayed in Handel's Messiah, King of kings and Lord of lords, and he shall reign forever. And ever. Dear people, this is the God that we worship. This is our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the one who is the creator, the sustainer, the one who keeps covenant with his people. This is the God who loved us enough to come in human form to be born as the babe in Bethlehem, to die on Calvary's cross, to pay for our sins. This is the God whom we worship. He is the one which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty, the one who in Revelation 1.8 says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and was and which is to come, the Almighty. We saw the second abbreviated form of God's name here in the text as I am. Our Lord Jesus Christ used that in John eight fifty six through 58 when he said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Jesus is speaking to them and telling them, these scribes and Pharisees, his critics and his mockers, Abraham rejoiced, past tense, to see my day. He saw it and was glad. And the Jews said unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. And he ties two portions of scripture together in the theophanic appearances that Jesus made to Abraham, for Jesus is God. Abraham was merely a man, a mortal, one to whom Jesus spoke and gave a covenant. He ties those passages in Genesis to the passage in Exodus 3 that is before us today, where Moses stands at the burning bush and God reveals himself to Moses, as well as to Abraham, the two chief figures at those very beginnings of the history of national Israel. Abraham, Moses. And he says, before Abraham was, ego emi, I am. Which is the name God declared to Moses out of the burning bush that we read this morning. And the Jews took up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple through the midst of them, and so passed by. We saw one other passage where Jesus uses that title, where it bowls people over in John 18, where they've come to arrest him. They say, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am. And as soon as he had said that unto them, I am, the equivalent of I am the name of God in the Old Testament, they went backward and fell to the ground. 
he manifested for them just a tiny portion of his power. The declaration of his name knocked his enemies to the ground in John 18. And so that brings us today to the second part of the names of God. There's another Old Testament passage and then a New Testament passage that I want us to turn to so that we can understand the name of God, Yahweh, as it is found at the second giving of the tables of the law, after Moses had smashed the first tables that God himself wrote with his own finger, you remember, he was coming down from the mountain, he heard the children of Israel reveling and having a party and dancing naked and drunk around a golden calf that Aaron had made for them, and saying, These be the gods, O Israel, which brought you out of Egypt. And Moses was furious and he smashed the tables of the law. Now we find God giving these tables again in the second time in Exodus 34. And this is the content, context of the Mosaic Covenant that God gave to national Israel there. Chapter 34 of Exodus, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai, and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. That wasn't a suggestion, that was a command. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount, neither let the flocks nor herds feed before that mount. And he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up into Mount Sinai and the, as the Lord commanded him and took in his hand the two tables of stone. Now listen to these next two verses. Here is God declaring his name as he gives the law. And the Lord descended in the cloud. That's the Shekinah glory cloud. We've talked about it. And stood with him there. Moses was talking face to face with God. He was talking face to face with Yahweh, Lord, L O R D, all capital letters. Jesus claims that Moses was talking with him, Jesus. That's serious business, folks. To make that kind of a claim and not to be God is blasphemy. Anybody who claims that they are I am, anyone who claims they are Jehovah, anyone who claims that even for a moment of time they have been Jehovah, the I am, has committed blasphemy. A serious offense in the eyes of the living God. Either Jesus is God indeed, or Jesus is a blasphemer. The conclusion that the scribes and Pharisees in John chapter 8 came to was, he's committed blasphemy, we've got to stone him to death, because stoning to death was the penalty for blasphemy. But Jesus demonstrated that he is, in fact, God by that which he did through his miracles, and then by his resurrection from the dead. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures, proving that he is the promised Messiah. That is our Lord Jesus Christ, not merely a man, not merely a prophet, not merely a miracle worker, but he is, and that's what we celebrate at Christmas. God come in the flesh. O come, O come, Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? What does this word out of the book of Isaiah mean? Imanu, with us. El, God. God with us. Dear friends, that's another of the names of God in this text. We'll get to it later. But know for a fact that Jesus, as Emmanuel, is God with us. Only God can save. No mere man can save you. No mere man can give you eternal life. 
Only God can do it, and God has determined the way in which it must be done. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And so God took upon himself human form, was born as the babe in Bethlehem, so that he might grow to manhood, and on Calvary's cross shed his blood for the remission of our sins. And he made one sacrifice for sin forever. He is infinite God. He can make an infinite sacrifice. No mere mortal, no mere angel could make an infinite sacrifice. For men and angels are temporal beings. An infinite sacrifice requires the God of the universe. And that is our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is portrayed as the eternal God, the one who is the creator of all things. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Jesus Christ is the creator God, according to John chapter 1. Jesus Christ is the God who appears in Genesis 1.1. Jesus Christ is the one who not only created us, but the one who sustains us. Magnificent, wonderful truth. And so here we find the Lord descended in the cloud. Who is this? It is our Lord Jesus Christ. And stood with him there. Now listen to the next phrase. What did he do while he was standing there with him? It says, And proclaimed the name of the Lord. He proclaimed the name of of the Lord. Israel needed to know the name of the Lord, not merely how to say it, though modern Jews will not say it when they read through the Hebrew text, they will not proclaim it. They will not even pronounce it a little bit. They take the consonants of Yahweh and add to them the vowels of Adonai. They will not proclaim it. The ultra-Orthodox won't even say the name. They will say when they get to it, Hashem, which means the name. Instead of pronouncing the name, they just say the name so that people will know that's what's next in the text, the name, Hashem. <laughs> Some of them are super-Orthodox, say, well, that's, that's even a little too close to pronouncing the name of God, so they say Hamakom, which means the place. <laughs> you know, heaven, where God dwells. So you get the idea, oh, we're talking about the one who lives up there. That's what we stick in. The Lord descended, and as he spoke to Moses, it says, he proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression of sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. As God passed before Moses, walking in front of Moses, back and forth, he proclaimed the name of the Lord. He didn't just say it. Did you notice how he described it? The Lord is first, that's Yahweh. Then he says, the Lord God, that's Yahweh Elohim. And then he describes. What is the first descriptor? This is a God who is a merciful God. Oh, how important it is that that shows at the head of the list. For here is Moses back with God on Mount Sinai after the children of Israel have committed this abomination of worshiping a golden calf. There is a God who is merciful. There is a God who is gracious. There is a God who is long-suffering. There is a God who is abundant in goodness and truth. There is a God who forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. Dear friend, if you are here today and understand that we have a God like that. That's the God to whom you flee for forgiveness. 
regardless of what you've done in the past, regardless of what you've been, regardless of where you've been, regardless of who you've associated with, regardless of all your sins and iniquities, there is a God that is merciful. There is a God that is gracious. There is a God that is long-suffering. There is a God that is abundant in goodness and truth. He's the God who's offering you salvation. But if you will not receive it, notice how he also describes himself in this passage. He is one who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children under the third and fourth generation. If you will not have the God of the Bible, if you will have instead some other God of your own making or of the works of men's hands, you can expect only judgment from him. When we come to him in humble repentance and in faith, he shines upon us with his grace and with his mercy. When we harden our hearts against him, he by no means clears the guilty. He's not just a fuzzy-headed old man with white hair sitting up in heaven and scratching himself and, oh, well, we'll just forgive them all because boys will be boys. He is a holy God, a righteous God, a just God, a God who judges sin when we do not come to him in repentance and faith. That's how God describes himself here in this passage. In verses 8 and following, what does Moses do? As the declaration of the name of God is made by our Lord on Mount Sinai there, it says Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. The declaration of the name of the Lord mandates worship. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people. And notice Moses' next phrase in verse 9. And pardon our iniquity and our sin. Moses has just heard God declare his name. That he's a God of mercy, he's a God of grace, he's a God of long-suffering, he's abundant in goodness and truth. Now Moses picks up on that. Moses appeals to the character of God, which he has just revealed in his name. Pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. And God responds. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant. Our God is a covenant-making God. He does that on the basis of his own character. That's the context here. Not on the basis of our goodness, because the people have sinned. He's a God who makes his covenant because of his character, his own personal integrity, and based upon his sovereign choice. It's a magnificent passage of scripture. Now I want to move briefly to the New Testament and the words of our Lord Jesus Christ concerning the declaration of the name of God. I think most of you are probably familiar, those of you especially who heard me preach through the Gospel of John, that John chapter 17 is what has been called the high priestly prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ. He intercedes for us as our great high priest. The book of Hebrews describes this for us in some detail, and we see it actually occurring in John chapter 17. Our Lord Jesus Christ in this chapter is not praying for everybody in the world. He's only praying for the elect. He's praying for those whom God has given him. And four times in this chapter, he bases precious doctrines that we believe upon the name of God. Listen to it as I read it. 
These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. This is just prior to the cross. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Here is Jesus once again speaking of his eternality. He was here before the world was. He is God, and he speaks to the Father. Speaking of the glory that they had together, a co-equal glory that belongs only to God before the world was. Now listen to verse 6. Here is one of our key verses, the first of the four. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. He says, I have manifested. To manifest is to show forth, not merely to say it, but he has manifested the name of God through his entire ministry, from his birth all the way up to this point, and obviously through the cross and resurrection. He is manifesting, showing forth, visibly, so that people can see it, he has manifested the name of the Heavenly Father. He has manifested the name of God. Rather interesting. Everybody saw it, but only some believed. And he focuses in on that in this verse. I have manifested thy name unto the men which Thou gavest me out of the world. As the name of God was manifested before the Pharisees, did they believe? No, they wanted to stone him. As the name of God was manifested before them, were they happy? No, on occasion it says that they were mad with fury because of what Jesus had done when he healed the man with the withered hand in the synagogue. He said, is it right to do good or to do evil on the Sabbath day? And everybody held their peace. And so he said to the man, come over here, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and it was whole as the other. And it says, they were mad against him. He was manifesting the name of God. One of the names of God that we'll study at a later date, the Lord willing, is Yahweh Rophe, Jehovah, my healer or my physician. What is Jesus doing? He is manifesting the name of God every time he does a miracle of healing. I have manifested thy name unto thy, the men which thou gavest me out of the world. There were those who saw it and did not believe, but there were those who saw it and believed. They understood the manifestation of the name of God. Verse 7. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. He explains to us what he means when these have believed the manifestation of the name of God. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. This is Jesus speaking. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Jesus knows the hour of his death is approaching. He knows that this very important moment where that sacrifice for sin for all time is about to be made on the cross. 
Now listen to the next phrase. Here again, he speaks of his name, the Father's name. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Fascinating. We're going to talk about something in just a second about name there, but, but did you notice that? There is a mystical unity of believers in oneness, like the mystical unity or relationship between the members of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He says that they may be one as we are. Keep them through your own name, those whom you've given to me, that they may be one as we are. The members of the Trinity are distinct. And yet there is a perfect union, perfect bond of love and fellowship, perfect unity. Throughout all of eternity past, all through time present, all the way into eternity future. When we as believers are ultimately in glory conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, that is, when we become in his presence those whom he designed us ultimately to be, will there be any fights among the believers? I think not. Will there be any backbiting or criticism? I think not. I know not. It will not be. Because we will be one with one another. Oh, we're not going to mass into some kind of a Brahmin oneness. We will be distinct persons, just like each of the members of the Trinity is distinct one from the other. But there will be a perfect unity and harmony and love and fellowship. Won't that be great? You parents who have kids, are there ever any conflicts there? Husbands and wives, ever any conflicts there? Grandparents trying to teach your children how to raise their children, your grandchildren. Ever any conflicts there? In eternity, that will all be gone. So what do we see here in this verse in relation to the name of God? We see that the name of God is the basis for our salvation. And the name of God is the basis for our eternal security. While I was with them in the world, I kept them through thy name. But now he's praying to the Father, keep them through thine own name, those whom you've given to me. The name of God, that is his character. All that he is, is the foundation for our salvation and for our eternal security. I think those are doctrines that are precious to us. And then he goes on and he says, now I'm coming to you, I speak these things in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. And he goes through, I won't read all those verses because our time is almost up. But we get down to verse 26, and he says it for the fourth time. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Do you get that? I have declared thy name unto them and will declare it, not only so that we can have God's kind of love, but the declaration of his name to those who believe is so that he can be in them. The Apostle Paul takes that in the epistles and makes it very clear that Jesus Christ is resident in those who have placed their faith in him. Christ in you the hope of glory. That is what guarantees that you are going to be in eternity with him. Not only are you in Christ, that's Ephesians chapter 1, but Christ in you, the hope of glory. What's it based on? The name of God. I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it, that the love for which thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. Now we didn't read all those verses in between, but let me summarize them quickly for you. If you look at that context between where Paul, uh, where Jesus talks about keeping them in thy name and declaring thy name and will declare it, you discover these things. The context indicates that our joy, our protection from evil, our separation, our sanctification, our effective witness, our unity, 
our ultimate glorification, our spiritual maturity, our testimony before the world, our communication of the relationship between the Father and the Son, and our love is based on the name and character of God. Do you think the name of God is important? <laughs> I submit to you that it's essential. We must know the God of the Bible, not merely know how to say his name. There are people in the world around us who take his name and they say it and they use it in vain. That's not what he's talking about. It's about truly knowing the name of God, knowing the God of the Bible, knowing his character, knowing what he's done for you, having trusted in this one whose name is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord. Get it? Lord? L-O-R-D. Yahweh. Jehovah. That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Dear friends, this is the God whom we worship. This is his name. Our time is up for today. There is much more that I want to say about the expression of the name of God and how his name is displayed in many different ways, many different portions of scripture. But I think that's a good place to stop today. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your name. We thank you that we may call you Father Oh, how that reveals your character as to what kind of a God you are. As a father pitieth his children. And how we thank you that you pity us. Gracious Father, we thank you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. That we can come into your presence. That he, through the blood of the covenant has rent the veil and made the way accessible so that we can come before your throne of grace to find mercy and grace in time of need. We come humbly before you, bowing at your feet. You are almighty God. You are the one who is our sustainer. You, is the one, you are the one who has become our salvation. You are the one who daily provides for us and protects us. Your name declares it. Your name manifests that you are a merciful God, a gracious God, a long-suffering God, a God who is full of goodness and truth, but your name also declares that you are a righteous God who will not let the guilty go free just because you are good. You are a God who will bring your justice and your wrath against those who reject you. Father, I pray that if there is one person here today who has never trusted in Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, the one who clearly and visibly manifested your name to us here in this world, if they have never trusted him who died for their sins, who was buried and who rose again, and trusted him alone, the one who is both God and man, the one who is our Redeemer, the one whom the book of Revelation declares will be the judge, whom Jesus himself said the Father hath committed all judgment unto the Son. If there is even one who has not trusted in the Christ of Scripture alone for salvation, that is listening to this message either here or over the Internet, Father, I pray that that one today would humbly fall before your feet and say, I have sinned and done evil in your sight. I am lost, I am undone, I am a sinner. But Christ came into the world to save sinners. And here I am, oh God, I am a sinner, but I believe that the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. And I'm trusting him alone today to save me. I believe he died for my sins. I believe he was buried and rose from the dead, proving his offer of salvation is true. And I trust him at this moment. Dear friend, if that's your condition, that should be your prayer. Phrase however your 
heart can phrase it, but acknowledging that Jesus died for your sins and rose again. And you want him and him alone to save you and give you eternal life. And as you pour out your heart before God, God who never lies, God who always keeps his promises at that moment when you trust Christ, you will be transformed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You will be given life and light and the peace that passes all understanding because you will know for sure that God has forgiven you and will welcome you in his time into his presence with joy. And Father, for those of us who know the Savior, oh, Father, let us not have arrogant hearts. Let us not think we know it all. For we are but mere beginners in knowing you, the true and living God. Cause us eagerly to search the scriptures every day to learn more about who you are and what it means when Jesus said, I have manifested thy name. What it means to declare his name before the nations. What it means when we see his name in scripture revealing his character and all that he, that you are. Father, we thank you for this, your word. Use it as you see fit, in Jesus' name. Amen.